good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your location. I'm George Beebe. I am the Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for the National Interest. Uh, today's <laughs> event is one that we are co-sponsoring with Harvard's uh, Belfer Center through its Russia Matters Project and through the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. I wanna thank Simone Sarajian uh, of Harvard's Russia Matters Project for help in organizing today's event. And I want to introduce and thank Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council uh, for her efforts to make today's event possible through the Zoom teleconferencing application. Melinda. Thanks, George. We're delighted to team up with you all again. We had a debate last month and we're looking forward to doing more with you in the future as well. So we're very, very excited to have more than 300 people here uh, for this debate. Looking forward to an energetic performance from all of you. I read uh, Dr. Allison's article this morning in Foreign Affairs and I really commend it. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, read the whole thing in depth. And I also wanna invite our audience to an event that we're hosting tomorrow on Ukraine's foreign policy at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So be sure to have a look at the Atlantic Council website. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it back over to George. We're, we're delighted to work with you and we look forward to this debate. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. And we look forward to more events for the Atlantic Council ourselves. So our event today is uh, about spheres of influence. And this is a topic that until recently was considered a settled matter uh, in the United States. Um, and, and it's an issue that all uh, post-Cold War American presidencies strongly opposed as uh, what they called a, a dangerous relic of the past. Uh, and I wanna read uh, for you all just a few quotations from our past presidencies to illustrate what the consensus view has been. So after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice declared that the United States would quote, resist any Russian attempt to consign sovereign nations and free people to some archaic sphere of influence. Then after Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, President Barack Obama warned Moscow, quote, the days of empire and spheres of influence are over. The Pacific region in its favor, and it denounces Russia's bid, quote, to restore its great power status and establish spheres of influence near its borders. Uh, this old consensus is increasingly being challenged, and we have the good fortune to have two of the prominent challengers here with us today on our online panel. Uh, one is Dr. Graham Allison of Harvard University, who, as Melinda pointed out, uh, recently published an article in Foreign Affairs challenging this consensus and arguing that the U.S. no longer has the power unilaterally to prevent spheres of influence altogether, and that we're gonna to have to approach this much more pragmatically. Then Paul Saunders, a senior fellow at the Center for the National Interest, joined this argument in an article he published on the Russia Matters site, arguing essentially the same thing, that we're going to have to look at this a lot more pragmatically and realistically than we have. Uh, now, uh, the what I would call the consensus view uh, is not without its continuing support. And we have two of those. Uh, of the Eurasia Center uh, and the Atlantic Council is uh, also someone who challenges these new challengers. So I hope we're in for a very lively discussion today. So how this is gonna work is I'm gonna give each of these panelists about five minutes for opening remarks. And then uh, I'm gonna give each of them an opportunity should they choose to react to what the other panelists have said. And then after that, I'm gonna open this whole discussion up to the audience for questions and answers. Uh, so we're gonna begin with uh, Graham Allison. Graham, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm honored to participate with such distinguished uh, panelists. I uh, had a good fortune to work with uh, 
uh, uh, one in the Clinton administration and to admire the work of the other as an ambassador uh, to Ukraine and Paul I've known at the Center for National Interest. So this is an opportunity for me. And I also thank the Center for National Interest for its, uh, I think, broad attitude in reaching out to an article in the Competitors Magazine uh, and recognizing it. Uh, so let me start with two uh, big uh, bottom lines up front. So if this is, as everyone says, a new era of great power competition, what does that mean? What does that imply for America's role in the world? Two points. First, discombobulation, disorientation, confusion, discovery that the presumptions and convictions that we previously held in a previous era no longer hold, that things we thought or said are no longer correct. If I could uh, stretch, maybe even a dose of humility as we recognize that we don't quite know what's going on. So I say to myself and to others, if you're not slightly confused about what's happening, you probably haven't started to begin understanding the problem. Uh, and I think therefore engaging in what we think we think, even when we're wrong, is a appropriate. Uh, and that's actually the purpose of this article, to provoke discussion, to have us help rethink some of the verities that we've been holding to. Second point, if the U.S. is no longer a unipolar power, and we recognize that China and Russia are serious uh, great power, great powers in themselves, that perforce says the U.S. is less powerful than we were before, or than we thought we were. So an axiom of strategy says diminished means can only achieve diminished ends. However much we may not like it, diminished means can only achieve diminished ends. So let me make four points quickly. First, I think in trying to think about this, we have to start with the structural uh, realities, the tectonics, and most people still don't get it, in my view. I uh, give my students a quiz. I say, uh, tell me uh, what percentage of the world's GDP was the U.S. in 1950, at the end of the Cold War in 1991, and today. And remember three numbers, 50 percent, 25 percent, and one-seventh. So let me say it again. We were half of the world's GDP in 1950. We were a quarter of the world's GDP into the Cold War. We're about a one seventh of the world's GDP today. Let me give you two more numbers. So in 1991, uh, China's GDP was about a quarter, less than a quarter of that of the US. Today, 120%. That's by purchasing power parity, which is the yardstick that CIA believes is the best metric for comparing national economies. Go to the CIA website and look at it. China is a larger economy than the US today. In terms of defense spending, China's defense spending was 125th of the US, uh, again, a, a quarter century ago. Today, about a third. And if you were to put that in purchasing and power parity more. So start with the structural tectonics. Second point, recognize the illusions and delusions of the unipolar era. I, I uh, challenge anyone to read the lines that we both read and said and believed in 1991, 92, 93, without smiling. So the, the pr principal thesis of the era was Frank Fukuyama's end of history. He argued that we had now come to the end of ideological debates, democracies in market economies were gonna be the future for everybody. And Tom Friedman extended that further with his famous, the world is flat and the McDonald's theory of peace. You, could, you, can't, you can go read it, but you can't read it without smiling. It says that two nations that have golden arches cannot go to war with each other because people will be standing in line to buy hamburgers and not prepared to fight. Okay. So I would say recognize the illusions. Third, remember history. So for 
several thousand years, great powers have exercised great power. This is almost a tautology. So great powers have used their great power to assert their interests and values, and in particular to do so along their borders and in adjacent seas, where they have demanded a degree of deference. That was true for Athens and Sparta. Thucydides has a good account of it. That was true for every other great power in history. So number four, I would say we should therefore dust off some of the concepts that were developed over centuries of statescraft to try to help us get ourselves oriented in this new world. And four of those that I discuss in the article are balances of power, spheres of influence, alliances, and maybe even this ancient concept called diplomacy, of which both Steve and John are great practitioners. So in terms of balances of power, if one state has a substantially disproportionate power relative to its neighbor, that casts a shadow that allows the more powerful to coerce the less powerful. That's a simple fact. And I take it that that fact has been recognized by every American president since World War II. So when each of those presidents has had an opportunity to stand up for freedom on behalf of freedom fighters or some other state that was in the sphere of influence of another state, they have said, yet. Uh, Eisenhower, when the Hungarians rose up in 56, Johnson in 68 for Czech Prague Spring, uh, Obama uh, for Georgia, when the choice was let Russia uh, crush Georgia and separate two territories or come to their defense. And uh, and currently, uh, sorry, that, that was Bush, excuse me, Bush 43, and then Obama when uh, Russia took a bite of Ukraine and Crimea. So on each one of those occasions, there were voices of the US government that said, we can't let these people uh, stand alone. Uh, we can't simply encourage them and condemn or even just sanctions. We should fight on their behalf. And in every instance, presidents looked at the matter and said, we're not gonna fight for the freedom of these states or these people because we risk a war with a great power that could end up being a war with us. And in a world in which other states have nuclear superpower arsenals, that could cause us to disappear. So I think that's just a simple hard fact. So to conclude, the article says, time for reassessment, reflection, judgment, basically I think a reckoning and a, a realignment of some of the things that we said and some of the commitments that we made. So this will, I predict, be a harsher, crueler world, unfortunately, and we shouldn't be happy about that, but I would say that's life uh, as far as I can see. All right, Grant, thank you very much. I think you've gotten us off to a wonderful and provocative start. Uh, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Steve Pfeiffer for his perspective on this uh, topic. Well, thank you, George. Uh, let me also thank uh, the Atlantic Council, the Center for the National Interest, and Russia Matters for organizing this discussion. Um, I'm going to focus my comments really on, uh, on Russia, which is my lane of expertise. And I'll begin by saying that it's very clear that the Kremlin is very interested in a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space. And by that, uh, what the Kremlin wants is for countries such as Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, to defer to Moscow on issues that the Kremlin deems important for Russian interests, regardless of the interests or desires of those countries. And it seems to me this goes a little bit beyond just influence. This is actually Russia trying to assert a measure of control in those neighbors. Now, just because the Russians want a sphere of influence, that does not mean that the United States should accept that. Uh, accepting a Russian sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space would basically be to deny countries such as Ukraine agency it would be to deny them the right to develop their own foreign and domestic policy courses. And we would be accepting a situation in which small countries would be expected to sacrifice their interests to the preferences of larger, more powerful neighbors, regardless of whether those preferences were legitimate or illegitimate. 
And I'd make one additional point too, is that accepting the Russian sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space would also lead to a sense, both in countries such as Poland and the Baltic states, American allies, a sense of greatly reduced security because they would then find themselves bordering that sphere of influence. And they would legitimately ask the question, do we know that Russian ambitions really stop at the old Soviet border? Now, Moscow's desire to have a sphere of influence is intense, so intense that I believe Moscow would be perfectly prepared to concede to the United States a sphere of influence in the post in the Western Hemisphere in return. That's not a trade that's in the American interest. And it really turns on the question of how do countries such as the United States and Russia pursue influence? Though it's diminished in the past several years, particularly under the Trump administration, U.S. influence derives from a power of attraction based on American ideals, the American economy, and soft power. And also, countries conclude it's in their security interests to align with the United States. But to the extent that the United States has influence in Western Hemisphere, in Europe or elsewhere, that really is a reflection of that power of attraction. Now, I'm not going to argue that the American interest here is entirely altruistic. Certainly, the United States derives benefits from that influence. And I'm also not going to defend every instance of American policy. I would argue, for example, that US policy towards Cuba has been misguided and is a 50-year failure. But if you compare how the United States pursues influence and how Russia pursues influence, you're going to see a very big difference. The Russian model does not entail much power of attraction. Russia does not have a great deal of soft power. And so when you look at the institutions that Moscow has tried to create in the post-Soviet space, such as the Collective Security Treaty Organization or the Eurasia Economic Union, you're not seeing a great deal of interest and enthusiasm on the parts of countries in the post-Soviet space to join those organizations. And so instead, the Kremlin has to resort to other techniques to advance its influence. And we've seen that over the past 30 years in Ukraine. You've seen Russia exploiting ethnic Russians to serve for political subversion purposes, Russian economic pressure denying, for example, Ukrainian free trade benefits. You saw energy pressure. So in 2006 and 2009, Russia cut off the flow of natural gas to Ukraine. You've seen cyber conflict against Ukraine. And over the last six years, you've seen Russian proxy forces and also regular units of the Russian army seizing Crimea and then provoking and sustaining a conflict in Donbass, which has now claimed some 14,000 lives. I would argue that's not the best way for Russia to be building influence. Let me also say that this is not to deny that Russia has legitimate interests with regards to its neighbors. It does, that's natural. But it gets to the question, how does Russia pursue those interests? If Russia sought to build a sphere of influence or influence based on its power of attraction on soft power, there would be no reason to object. And if other countries, if Georgia, Belarus, decided to align with Russia because they concluded it's in their interest, again, there's no reason to object. Where the objection comes in is when Russia tries to force countries to align with Russia against those countries' own calculation of what is in or is not in their interest. Finally, let me just note that I think Accepting the Kremlin's effort to build a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space Thank you, uh, George, and thank you, uh, of course, to the Center for the National Interest to Russia Matters, uh, to the Atlantic Council. Uh, really delighted to be here with all of you uh, today. Uh, I'm going to try to make five points uh, very quickly, and if I have enough time uh, after doing that, I'll perhaps respond a little bit to some of the things that Steve said, or, or we can uh, uh, let that wait uh, until later. And Lud Graham, I, I really want to go back uh, to, uh, to the fundamentals, uh, because I think the fundamentals are important. So first, you know, I would argue that uh, there are places in the world where America's rivals, you know, whether that's Russia or China or someone else, uh, have greater capabilities and greater interests uh, than the United States. Uh, I, I think that's a, a fact. Uh, if we want to debate that, certainly welcome to, uh, you know, welcome that conversation. Uh, point number two, 
I think because these areas exist, uh, uh, it, it's kind of difficult for the United States uh, to, to make policy that advances our own interests in those places. We found that very challenging, uh, actually, uh, because of a combination of their power, their commitment, uh, our limitations, and uh, 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 in some cases, even our self-imposed uh, constraints. Uh, thirdly, you know, to the extent that we want to do better and have good American policy, uh, we need to be kind of honest with ourselves and realistic uh, about the, the world that we face. We need to understand actually that there are uh, cases in international affairs when we don't have good options and we have to choose the least bad uh, option uh, actually uh, among our choices. Uh, that gets me to my uh, fourth point, and here I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, aligning uh, uh, very much uh, with Graham. You know, we have a lot more thinking to do uh, about how to come up with uh, effective policies to deal with these problems. Uh, I would argue that our policy uh, toward uh, Georgia leading up to and, and following the events of August 2008 uh, uh, has not been that successful. I would argue that our policy toward Ukraine leading up to and following uh, February, March 2014 uh, has not been very successful. Uh, and since those two policies haven't been very successful, I think we need to re-examine uh, some of our assumptions, re-examine the, the choices and decisions and analysis that led us to make the, the decisions that we made uh, throughout a, a long period of time, uh, and, and try to decide uh, how uh, to do better. Uh, finally, uh, I think, you know, we need to have a name for these regions of the world. Uh, that uh, wh where we have to contend with our rivals' uh, capabilities and interests. Uh, in the past, uh, people called that a sphere of influence. Uh, I, I'm not wedded to the name sphere of influence. It's clearly uh, something that has a lot of negative historical connotations. Uh, it, it's not a, uh, uh, certainly not a, a kind of a way of doing business uh, that I would want to advocate. Uh, but we have to call it something. Uh, it can be uh, gray zones. Uh, it, it can be something else. Uh, but if, if we want to uh, uh, have a robust uh, discussion about what to do, you know, we, we, we need a name. Uh, finally, uh, and, and this here, I'll just respond very narrowly to Steve on, on one point. I'm not talking here about the United States government, uh, the State Department, the White House issuing a press release uh, saying that we have decided that spheres of influence exist and the following to tell uh, uh, other countries that they're part of someone else's uh, sphere. We, we have to recognize that these challenges exist. We have to recognize that our policies in the past have not succeeded. We have to recognize that we have limitations uh, and we have to try to find a way to do better. Let me, uh, let me stop there. Six minutes, sorry. George, you're muted. Great. Excellent job staying uh, more or less to the time limit, Paul. Uh, now I turn to John Herbst. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, I'd like to thank Graham and Paul for performing a real service in talking about the importance of understanding the real world as it operates, understanding that spheres of influence exist, that we're in a great competition, with actually we're in a competition with great powers, and that means and ends must be in sync in order to have a successful foreign policy. 
and I'm willing to concede all these things up front. Uh, but when it comes to the application of these concepts, I think Steve has it right. And I think that Paul and Graham are on the wrong side of things. Uh, we are in a great power competition with China and with Russia. And there's no question that their values and their interests as they currently define them cut against American interests and the interests of our allies. And in a period of great power competition, it behooves us to try as best we can to weaken our adversaries. And the way to do that is to minimize the spheres of influence that they will try and with some success create. And that's, that's the important point to start. But then there's the analytical point as well. Um, Paul and Graham are operating at 30,000 feet and they're focusing essentially on just great powers. And certainly any foreign policy realist, realist needs to understand what the great powers are up to, their capabilities and their intentions. But to look at any specific foreign policy problem, you have to come down from 30,000 feet and get your hands and your feet in the mud to understand the local realities. And when you do that, you recognize that great powers are not always destined to project their influence in their neighborhood. Uh, Graham came up with a number of historical examples where the United States decided not to challenge a great power, principally the Soviet Union, when the Soviets repressed uh, Czech Republic, excuse me, Czechoslovakia, Hungary in 68 and 56, and of course in Georgia when Russia uh, tried to did the same with Georgia. And we also did not intervene militarily in Ukraine. But there are other instances when we, we struck back against great powers and working in their neighborhood. If we didn't, we would not have gone into South Korea in 1950 and stopped the an aggression that would have taken over the whole peninsula. And it's worth recognizing too, and again, any real us would understand this, that great powers are not always going to win in conflicts with their neighbors. Uh, again, the Soviet Union learned that in Korea, uh, but even without great power intervention, the Chinese learned that in Vietnam in 1979, and Russia is learning that right now in Ukraine. The United States is providing substantial support, but it is not sending military assistance. We have a vital interest in helping Ukraine win, not that we would use our soldiers, we have a great interest in helping Ukraine win because Russia's intentions are hostile to us. We are lucky that we had the sense in the 1990s to oversee the expansion of NATO, not that we pushed it, as Steve Pfeiffer correctly points out, the countries that joined NATO wanted to join and we said yes. Because if we had not expanded NATO in the 1990s, Moscow's current war in Donbass might be fought along the Vistula. It's worth recalling, since we're talking about history, that Russia took control of Eastern Poland at the same time it seized Crimea in the late 18th century. And it's important to understand that Mr. Putin's objectives are hostile to NATO, to the transatlantic relationship, to the EU. And any realist, under, realist understands that you give Putin troubles in Donbass, you're far less likely to have troubles with Mr. Putin in the Baltics or in Romania or in Poland. And the same is true, of course, with China. China gave up its quote unquote peaceful rise in the wake of the Great Recession and began to push on an expansionist course in the East and the South China Seas, greatly upsetting its neighbors. Just as it is our interest to support Ukraine, it's also in our interest to work with Japan and India and Australia and ASEAN to limit China's aggressive outreach in Southeast Asia and in the seas around it. That is very much an American national interest. And um, I almost see a nostalgia on the, port of, on the part of Paul and Graham for the sphere of influence that the Soviet Union exercised. Let's remember, let's remember. I, I reject that, that. I'm sorry, John. I I, that's that. what I said almost. Hear me out. Hear me out. You'll have a chance to respond later. 
That sphere of influence was when Moscow was at its absolute historical apogee. They could, they could control that part of the world because the Red Army was there at the end of World War II when we wanted the Soviet Union to help us with Japan. But Russia is much weaker today than the Soviet Union ever was. And Russia is in fact a declining power because unlike China, it does not have a world-class economy. And again, it's an hour and just a pushback. And any realist recognizing American interests, American values, and the power of local powers like Ukraine, like Vietnam, will seek to work with them to limit the outreach of both Moscow invasion. That's the true realist policy of America. And a sustainable one. Thank you. All right, very good. So uh, my <coughs> would have some sharp uh, differences of opinion has already been realized. Uh, I want to give uh, uh, every panelist an opportunity to react to what's been said so far. I see Graham has his hands up, so I'll start with him. Okay, so thank you very much. Excellent uh, uh, points by both John and Steve. And we could take each one and wrestle with it for a long time. Let me uh, just try to be brief in responses. So first, I think I appreciate that John uh, agrees with the essential conceptual analysis and that uh, there are spheres of influence. The question is whether we should contend with other states in those spheres of influence. And I agree with that completely. My proposition is not that we should simply accept and ignore. It is that we're not going to fight over Ukraine, and we shouldn't. And those who propose that we should or did would have been mistaken, I believe. We didn't fight over Hungary. That was a debate. I think that was the right choice. We didn't fight over Georgia. I believe that was the right choice. So the reality that other states will be able to use hard power to their advantage doesn't mean the end of the game. I think this is a long-term competition and all uh, instruments are in order, but that's the first proposition. Uh, so I'm not endorsing what Russia's doing. I'm not endorsing what China's doing. I don't like that. I would like to resist it, but I would say there's some realities and the realities that where they have military power to exert their influence as they have done, that we cannot deny that. So indeed, I would even be more provocative and say the attempt, this gets to both John's and, and Steve's point, uh, and I don't want to misstate this, but I would say we should ask ourselves, what were the consequences of Americans and Europeans illusions about the denial of spheres of influence that can be uh, defended by military means. What were the consequences of those actions, first in the case of Georgia and second in the case of Ukraine? And when I read that story, I cannot understand Russia's action and I think I, nobody would have expected or predicted and I think actually Russia's actions or Georgia's actions wouldn't have been Georgia's actions without the Bush administration's mistaken encouragement of Georgia to, uh, to become on the admissions list for, for uh, NATO. And similarly, I don't think we would have seen what we saw in Ukraine had the Western Europeans with some American support not misplayed our hand badly in the case that Ukraine was sliding towards first EU and then towards NATO. But that's a debate we could have in itself. Finally, let me say about Steve's points. I think that uh, it would be fine to declare a world in which great powers only compete with soft power. So one could say that, but I would say, I predict that will be put into the, into the uh, list of illusions and delusions. So this is like declaring the end of history to great powers use of hard power. We can say they shouldn't use hard power. We would like for them to compete in their way, in that way, but I would say states in history have always exercised hard power. China and Russia will be exercising hard power. The reason why the realities in Syria today are what they are, ugly as they are, is that Russia was prepared to exercise hard power. So I would say that's the overwhelming reality. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. We can condemn it, but I would say we have to live with it. All right, Steve Pfeiffer. Yeah, yeah, let me make one response to Graham, then a couple responses to uh, Paul's points. I mean, first, Graham, uh, 
Uh, I'm not ignoring hard power, but what I'm saying is there's a very real difference between a country that tries to build a sphere of influence or build its influence on using soft power or hard power. Uh, going to Paul's points, Paul, uh, okay, I, I hear what you're saying about, you're, you're saying that the United States government should not come out and say, we accept a sphere of influence. That's fine. But I think if you look at what you've suggested, though, in the, over the course of your intervention, uh, that would certainly be seen by most of the world as the United States accepting a sphere of influence, even if the United States government did not publicly say it. The second point, um, I agree with you that uh, countries will have an asymmetry of interests uh, and that Russia may care more than the United States does about Ukraine. But you're leaving out a third party, which is the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians care most of all about their foreign policy course and their domestic policy course. And basically by conceding or accepting the Russian sphere of influence, you're telling Ukraine, uh, you know, you, those rights somehow matter less than our concern about Russia. And then finally, a point that I disagree is, um, you know, I, I would um, not call American policy towards Ukraine a failure. Uh, you know, if you go back, and uh, Graham may recall this, but back in the Clinton administration, we said, what does the United States want to see in Ukraine, a country that would be in the American interest? It was an independent, democratic, stable state with a growing market economy, increased links with the West, and good relations with Russia. Now, you can't check every one of those boxes, but you can say that Ukraine is independent. You can say that Ukraine is democratic, uh, and Ukraine is making progress on some of those other issues. Uh, and again, I think it would be a very different Ukraine if we simply said we're washing our hands of it, and Ukraine is basically, you know, should go back into the Russian orbit. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you have a response? Uh, yeah, I, I, I sure do, as you might imagine. I mean, I, I guess uh, maybe responding first to Steve and then some other points. So first of all, on our policy toward Ukraine, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't argue that it's failed in every respect. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we have a situation now in which Russia is uh, occupying Crimea uh, and is likely to do so indefinitely. Uh, the United States does not have a realistic uh, policy to, to change that in any kind of politically meaningful time frame. Uh, and there's a, a, a very tragic uh, conflict underway uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, that's created uh, millions of refugees and a lot of physical destruction, uh, you know, more, more than 10,000 people dead, uh, and, and all kinds of other problems uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't think we can really uh, separate that reality uh, from the, the choices that we've, we've made during this time period. Uh, now, uh, you know, John mentioned uh, Korea and our intervention in Korea. You know, as I recall, the Korean War, actually, you know, we, we intervened in Korea, of course, and I, I think that was a, a good decision. But the way I remember my history, uh, uh, the U.S. and United Nations forces started moving closer and closer toward the Chinese border. Uh, and then China uh, intervened in that conflict in a very substantial way, uh, driving uh, our forces back, uh, prolonging that conflict, uh, and, and ultimately producing uh, a divided Korea. So to my mind, actually, that's a, a, a case that kind of uh, uh, strengthens the argument that, that powers have uh, important interests in their neighborhood uh, and that there can be uh, costs uh, associated with uh, not taking that into account uh, adequately. Uh, let me just also say there's a, a case actually that, that John, you didn't mention of the United States standing up uh, to the Soviets in their neighborhood, you know, which is Afghanistan. And I, I have to say on balance, I, I think that was the right decision uh, but I, I think it would also be kind of a mistake for us, uh, you know, decades later, uh, not to acknowledge that there were some other consequences of, of that choice uh, for the United States, because the allies who we had to uh, align ourselves with in order to do that 
uh, you know, ultimately became uh, a really big problem for America uh, on September 11th. So uh, I, I think the, the issue here is not, you know, should we or should we not uh, confront great powers uh, that are rivals of the United States? We should. I, I think that's very clear. You know, when, when we're in great power competition, we have to compete. We shouldn't unilaterally disarm. Uh, I, I think the discussion uh, that we need to have uh, is how do we do this effectively? Uh, and doing it effectively, uh, first and foremost, requires understanding, as I think both Graham and I have tried to argue, uh, what our own limitations are. Uh, and what some of the unintended or second order consequences of our choices uh, might be. Uh, and trying to factor those in uh, in advance so that we don't uh, overextend ourselves, so that we don't get into situations, and you know, Graham mentioned 1956, where uh, you know, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, I guess it was just Radio Free Europe at that time, I think was uh, uh, kind of encouraging uh, people in Hungary to believe that the United States uh, what was there to support them, uh, uh, encouraging a, a rebellion that Eisenhower was, was never uh, going to, to intervene to support. Uh, and for anyone who wants American policy not only to be effective, but also to be moral, uh, I, I think it's profoundly immoral to encourage uh, allies and partners to think that they will get uh, more support from us uh, than they're actually really likely to get when the chips are down. So I believe fully in living up to every commitment that the United States makes. Uh, but because uh, I believe that, I also believe in making those commitments very carefully. And I think that's what uh, we need to be talking about uh, here. Sorry for the long comment. Great, Paul, and, and thank you for introducing the question of morality into this at this point in the debate, because I'm sure that will provoke a response. I John, imagine so. <laughs> John, do you have uh, anything that you'd like to say on any of the points made so far? Okay, one specific, then one larger point. The specific point concerns Korea. My point was that if we intervene, in 1950, South Korea would have been gobbled up. Paul's right on the mistake of we tried to cross the, the DMZ. That was a serious mistake, and I, I certainly disagree with it. It was a bad decision. But it's also worth making another point here. The reason why you had the initial invasion of South Korea was because we were recognizing, in effect, the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, if not communist China, when Dean Atchison gave his famous speech in the early 1950s when he kept South Korea outside of our defense perimeter. That was a case where our acknowledgement of spheres of influence led to war, a very serious mistake. Now, my broader point is this, both Paul and Graham seem to think that somehow American response policy was responsible for the Russian invasion of Georgia and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Nonsense. Here's the point. Uh, yes, we talked about Ukraine and Georgia being part of NATO. That was part of the Bucharest summit, NATO summit in 2008. But that summit in no way endorsed the concept of them joining in anywhere in the near future. There was a vague talk about them having the right to join in the future. Everyone knew that that was not going to happen in decades, if at all. Russia was intervening in Georgia in the 1990s. Uh, uh, Russia's policy near abroad the overt intervention preceded any American policy. Russia chose to aggress against Ukraine because Ukraine was going to create a, free, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. We weren't talking about Ukraine becoming part of NATO. We weren't talking about Ukraine becoming part of the EU. Russia was insisting that Ukraine be open to the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, last point. American policy in Ukraine has been a success. Steve outlined why. The policy that's truly failed in Ukraine is Putin's. Ukraine, Putin was the most popular politician in Ukraine when I was ambassador there in the early 2000s. As a result of Kremlin intervention in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution, Putin no longer was the most powerful, excuse me, the most popular politician in Ukraine. As a result of Putin's aggression, 
when a major foe of the United States or adversary of the United States is bogged down, his economy is hurting because of their failed foreign policy. That is a policy success for us. But it only is a policy success for us because the Ukrainian people want to fight for their own territorial integrity. And they have that right. And we should support them short of war. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you all for your opening remarks and responses. We uh, have a limited amount of time about the SETIA. Any responses? Well, I, I, I would note that uh, Ambassador Corton did not mention the question of Crimea. <laughs> but it seems to me... when they seized Crimea, this was not about Ukraine's relationship with NATO. Viktor Yanukovych had made clear back in 2010 that he wanted a good relation with NATO, but he didn't want to join it. He didn't want a membership action plan. The Russians pressed Ukraine, not because of NATO, because of Ukraine's desire that was supported by a large portion of the population to sign a comprehensive free trade arrangement with the European Union. So I don't think that the United States and NATO swearing off of Ukraine and Georgia changes that calculation in Moscow. The Russians are still going to be using their various devices to build that sphere of influence. Let me, can, I, can I disagree? <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, Graham, you have to agree. <laughs> okay. So uh, I uh, don't know this, the details of this story as well as you and uh, John do, since you were in the middle of it. But I certainly know the Russian side of the story and I've watched this. I think at this stage on to, the, to Bill Courtney's question, I think it's probably too late to go back and unscramble this omelet. But I wish we had uh, taken that action before. And it seems to me that uh, for anybody to have watched the U.S. government in the run up to the Budapest summit and all of the efforts it made and then the conclusion of the summit in 2008, as John rightly said, is uh, Georgia is on a, on a path to NATO membership, and the Bush administration is seeking to bring Georgia into NATO. And the reason why they didn't is, fortunately, uh, there was an adult, an adult in the room, Mrs. Merkel, who said, no, absolutely not. So that was a well-known discussion in advance and caused a great deal of alarm in Moscow as it would reasonably have done. And secondly, anyone who imagined that a Russian government would see Crimea with its naval base at Sevastopol come within the territory of, an, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a NATO ally without uh, intervening if they could possibly was missing the reality. They wouldn't accept that. They didn't accept that. They would predictably not accept that. And while I agree with John's characterization that what was happening in Ukraine in the period right before that was the Western Europeans especially led, but with our support of pulling NATO West into a close set of economic relations in the calculations and in the discussion, their notion of them becoming an associate and then ultimately a member of the EU and in time, a member of NATO was certainly in the on the table. Again, well, I think that we should keep open the prospect of NATO membership for Ukraine. I don't see that as a near-term possibility. And the Russians have to understand where the Germans are, where the French are, where other allies are. I mean, this was simply not a realistic prospect. And uh, you know, the United States, you know, this kind of decision has to be taken by the alliance by consensus. Whatever policy view you might have had in the United States, uh, you know, that was not going to change the situation. And I think the Russians were smart enough to understand that. This came down to really Ukraine's relationship with the European Union. George, we have a question here. Sorry, Paul, we don't have a lot of time uh, left, right. so let, let me move on to the question. This one comes from Jacob Heilbrunn, who just so happens to be the editor of The National Interest. Uh, 
Uh, he asks about coronavirus, and I think we'd be remiss if we don't talk about that issue in the context of this, this specific debate. He says, John Pomfret argues in the Washington Post that both America and China, in bungling the coronavirus, have gravely damaged their reputations and power, forfeiting their respective claims to supremacy. Is he wrong? Graham. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you, you want more? Okay. So, it, again, Americans don't like to face reality. Uh, and there's no question that China made uh, some big mistakes in the first inning in trying to confront coronavirus. But the hard facts about what's happening in China today is that Apple stores are not open in Washington. They're not open in New York. They're not open in Boston. They're open in China. The airport in Wuhan opened this week. People are flying from Wuhan to all over other cities in China and some internationally. So after having finally awakened to the, to the threat, China's response using measures that we find objectionable and many of them are and wouldn't be appropriate for us, but nonetheless has made a significant impact and actually the Chinese, both in terms of their performance and then in terms of their very extensive support now to more than 80 countries in selling and sending assistance and medical equipment have taken advantage of this in terms of the longer term rivalry uh, and to support the narrative of an inevitably rising China and a de declining US. On the other hand, I think we're all frustrated to the point of dismay about the American government stumbling response to this in the first phase, in the second phase, in the third phase, in my view, continuing today. So it'll be impossible to uh, think about both domestically for the US and China, but also internationally, uh, the standing and stature and confidence in each of these two countries and systems without uh, having uh, in mind uh, this vivid, vivid experience has captured the imagination of people all over the world of coronavirus and who did what. Now, finally, I'd say the good news about democracies is that they're very slow off the mark. We usually screw up uh, and then we screw up again. But as Churchill said, we eventually come to the right answer. Initially in wars, if this is a war on coronavirus, if it was declared over at the end of the first quarter, we lose. So in the Revolutionary War, if it stopped in 1776, we lost. In the First World War, we didn't even arrive till the end. In World War II, uh, Hitler had almost overrun Europe before we got there. So I would say don't count us out. I'm not counting us out. But unless and until we manage a response to this that will be uh, uh, as successful as China's, people will look at our system and look at their system and say, huh. Oh, Okay, very good. Now, uh, we have one more question I'd like to get in. We only have about four minutes left in this. This is from Mark Katz of George Mason University, and he raises the question of how do you regulate this kind of great power competition? He says, great power acceptance of an, one another's spheres of influence appears to be a way of limiting tension among them. But Conceding a certain set of countries to an adversary may simply encourage it to expand its sphere of influence further, therefore increasing great power tension. Can this problem be avoided? Reactions? Probably not. <laughs> okay, well, Graham. I think, I think that the uh, Cold War provides for us some lessons in this respect. Uh, the idea of living for four decades with captive nations whom an evil empire had occupied with their own troops and were, and were ruling by puppet governments was an ugly, ugly, ugly reality. But as I argued before, one that we learned to live with because, or, or, or if lived with to a degree, if the alternative was to fight about. And I, that didn't mean that we accepted the evil empire uh, 
uh, for as good. It didn't mean that we approved of it. it. Didn't mean that we continued, didn't continue competing in every way we could. Indeed, even trying to undermine it. And I think the Cold War strategy may offer some clues with respect to the competitions that we're engaged in in these instances, in which on some items for some time, one's got to live with an ugly reality, not not applaud it, not approve of it, but to live with it as you compete in other arenas uh, and hope over time either uh, states e evolve to a more enlightened point of view or alternatively, as in the case of the Soviet Union, collapse. Um, and as I said earlier, there seems to be a whiff of nostalgia for the Cold War in the air, which I don't think is really necessary. The reason why you had this strong Soviet presence in Eastern Europe for almost a half a century was because the Red Army was the most powerful army at the end of World War II. Russia is nowhere near as powerful today. Uh, great power competition in spheres of influence means that the, the, the boundaries, the frontiers are always shifting. We should understand that. And we make sure we should use our advantages, both military, economic, and so on, to work things in Eastern Europe in our favor, which also has the advantage of being consistent with the wishes of the people of Eastern Europe. Let me add one last point, which is I think a lot of what the Russians do, including in developing a sphere of influence, is driven by Russian domestic politics. If you go back to the 2000s, Vladimir Putin was content or said he did not object to NATO enlargement at a time when the Russian economy was growing and the Kremlin could base regime legitimacy on rising living standards. When Putin came back to the presidency in 2012, the economic situation was much more grim and you saw him return to these themes of Russia as a great power, Russia nationalism. So a lot of Russia is doing in its neighborhood is not because of American policy, it's because of domestic situations and domestic politics within Russia. All right, Steve, I commend you because you have answered just on the dot for our 3.30 closing point. So I commend all of the panelists. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Thank you also to the audience uh, obviously, we couldn't address all the questions that everyone had, but that simply tells me we have a lot of room for further continuation of this discussion. I think our next debate, George, needs to be on who's responsible for Georgia and Ukraine. <laughs> Great. I, I, think, I think that would be a lively one. Thank you so very much for joining us once again. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.